Okie dokie. Alright, so today we are looking at our new topic, uh, which is on human rights. And I want to address a couple of issues in this lecture. I want to address uh, what we mean by human rights, what are human rights, and go into that a little bit. Um, and also to look at the tension between human rights as a universal concept applicable uh, to all human beings. And the tension between that and the, the a concept that existed within international relations really for about 300 years prior to the dominance of human rights thinking, which is the concept of state sovereignty. Um, so those, those are the kind of issues I want to address here. Uh, and before I go into kind of, uh, sort of the, the theory and so on of it, I want to give a little bit of historical background. So let's start off 1948 you had the UN um, issue the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, this um, very important document, vast majority of the world states um, then and now are signed up to it. Um, there's 30 articles in the Universal Declaration um, and the idea of human rights is that these are rights to which all human beings are entitled simply by virtue of being human and I suggest you get this definition down word for word in your notes um, because it's useful anytime you get a, an essay on human rights to be able to just um, put down this definition somewhere in the introduction. So we define human rights as the rights to which all humans are entitled simply by virtue of being human. In other words, they apply to all human beings. Um, whichever country they're in, whatever race they are, whatever state they're a citizen of, or if they're not a citizen of any state, if they're in prison or not, etc, etc. Um, we'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. Um, so the, U the Universal Declaration of Human Rights included two main types of rights, um, civil and political rights. So that would be things like, well, why don't you pause the video at this moment? and see if you can list some specific civil and political rights. Okay, go ahead. So we're talking about things like um, the right not to be subject to slavery, or the right not to be tortured, uh, the right to a fair trial, uh, the right to privacy, freedom of movement, these kinds of things. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also uh, included social and economic rights. So things like the right to education, um, the right to social security, uh, the right to health care, and things like this. Um, also the distinction between civil and political rights on the one hand and social and economic rights on the other, sometimes also known as the difference between negative freedoms and positive freedoms, but we'll go into that later as well. Okay, so that was 1948. The, sig the, the significance of that, of course you'll all know that was just three years after the end of the Second World War and that is not a coincidence, we'll look at that later in the lecture. But I want to rewind at this point to th exactly 300 years before the Universal Declaration, in 1648. Um, international relations from 1648 up to the signing of the Universal Declaration was really framed in the context of what was called the Treaty of Westphalia. Um, West and then P-H-A-L-I-A, -A, the Treaty of Westphalia, named after the German town in which it was signed. And <clears throat> the reason I'm going into this is because the Universal Declaration really challenged the idea of state sovereignty that had come out of the Treaty of Westphalia and had really governed international relations or at least relations between European states for those 300 years from 1648 from the signing of the treaty. Just a bit of background for this treaty, you'll never get a question on it specifically, but it's useful I think to understand really where this concept of state sovereignty come, came from and why it was considered so important. So. In the early 17th century, early 1600s, uh, Europe was really tearing itself apart in what was known as the Thirty Years' War. This was a war fought over religion. Um, it was the era of the so-called Reformation, when many Christians were breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and declaring their own form of uh, Christianity, free from the control of Rome uh, and its bishops. So this was the split between Catholicism and Protestantism within Christianity. So what was happening is that Protestant states and Catholic states were constantly at war with one another um, because each, of course, thought that their 
mode or brand of Christianity was the only one true brand of Christianity and they wanted to impose it on everyone else, basically. So after 30 years of warring between Catholic and Protestant states, eventually the Treaty of Westphalia uh, was signed. That was the peace agreement that ended the 30 years war. Um, and it was that this peace deal was established and established the principle of state sovereignty. Very simply, this is the idea that the domestic affairs of each state, in other words, what happens within each state, is the sole concern of that state alone. Yeah, I'll repeat that. The, num the domestic affairs of each state are the sole concern of that state alone. In other words, in the context of the wars of religion, if I'm the uh, prince of a German state, then if, if that state is going to be Protestant or Catholic, that's my business, no one else's business. Yet the government of each state can decide everything that happens within that state. It's no one else's business, what religion the people should be and everything else that happens within their jurisdiction, within the borders of the state they control. So that's really the idea of state sovereignty. Within its own territory, each government, each state is sovereign over that territory um, and it's no one else's business how they run that territory. Um, so this brought an end to uh, the Thirty Years' War and it established the concept um, <clears throat> that basically if you don't like another state's religion, well, that's no longer a valid reason for going to war. Yeah, that's not uh, justification enough to wage war on another country. So this, this was the principle of state sovereignty. And we should note here, by the way, that it's often you'll often see in the textbooks it will say this was the kind of principle governing international relations from 1648 onwards. That's not entirely true. Just as a kind of footnote, an aside here, but an important aside, it should be noticed the principle of state sovereignty was never respected by Europe in relation to the countries of Africa, Asia, uh, and the Americas, which were all invaded, colonized, and plundered at will during the colonial period, as we know. Um, and arguably still today, the sovereignty of those states is not um, respected. Think about the structural adjustment programs that were forced on the countries of particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. Think about um, the coups that were supported by Britain and the USA in places like the Congo, Indonesia and Iraq uh, and so on during the Cold War. Think about the drone bombings over Pakistan today that the Pakistani government doesn't accept and yet the US conduct at will. Think about the invasions of Libya, um, Iraq, Afghanistan and so on. So we could argue that even up to the present day, the sovereignty of the states of the Global South is not respected by Europe and North America. Uh, and certainly during the colonial period it wasn't. So maybe we could better think of state sovereignty as, as, as a principle that governed the conduct uh, and relation between European states. They respected each other's sovereignty to an extent, or they were supposed to. Um, but yeah, just worth noting, it was never accepted as a universal global principle by which all states should treat each other. Okay, that aside, so, <coughs> um, okay, nevertheless then, it was considered to be the kind of supreme principle governing, um, as I say, international relations or at least European relations. But something happened that made people begin to question the paramount supremacy of this principle of state sovereignty. Now, I'm going to ask you a question again, pause the video in a second and see if you can think it through with your knowledge of history. What do you think? Just before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed in 1948, what had happened historically just before that, uh, and I'll give you a clue here, during the Second World War, that made people question this idea of state sovereignty. In other words, made people dubious about this idea that each state should be allowed to do whatever it wants in their own territory. Just consider that. What happened during the Second World War that cast in, into doubt the idea that really each state should be able to do just exactly whatever it wants within its own territory? Pause the video and have a think. Okay, did you get it? Really, the major event was the Holocaust. Think about the Holocaust, the rounding up of Jews, Gypsies, Roma people, disabled people, gay people and so on into death camps, the extermination of entire groups of, of, of people, entire ethnicities in some cases, 
the reality of this led many people to believe that, well, actually, maybe there should be limits to state sovereignty. Maybe when states try to do certain things within their own territory, there should be red lines and it does become other people's business and it does become the concern of other people. Um, so it, it, this, this brought about the idea post Second World War that m maybe there should be some basic standards which all states should upheld, uphold, sorry, um, such as not exterminating entire groups of people within their territory. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, was the result. Um, we should note here, it was not the first attempt uh, to create standards of behaviour um, across that applied across state borders. Um, the, the textbook refers to things like the 1926 Slavery Convention, uh, outlawing uh, slavery um, across different states. Um, several conventions governing the rules of war, such as the 1907 Hague Conventions, the 1925 Chemical Weapons Treaty, to which all signatories, you know, signed up to basically agree not to use chemical weapons. Uh, and probably most famously, the 1926 Geneva Conventions governing the treatment of prisoners of war. Um, so all countries agreed that if they took uh, prisoners, other soldiers prisoner during wars, there would be certain standards uh, that would be maintained. They'd treat them in a certain way, they wouldn't talk to them and so on. Um, nevertheless, before 1948, before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all of these developments remained, we can say, marginal to the overriding Westphalian thrust of, of, of international relations, this principle of state sovereignty. Okay, so that's the historical background really, and I and I go into I went into that in a bit of depth to really show you what a sea change it was uh, from the Treaty of Westphalia and the principle of state sovereignty to then the idea of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was a big deal because obviously human rights and automatically to some way undercut the principle of state sovereignty. Um, because if there are certain standards to which all states are obliged to live up to and comply with, then then to a certain extent they're losing some of their sovereignty. Yet if I say everyone has the human right to um, uh, freedom of association, then it means I, as a state, if I sign up to that, I'm giving up the right to ban people from being members of certain political parties, for example.